I made a series of videos recently about the sublime and the sacred and because there's quite a lot of them I thought I'd make a quick menu for them just to make life easier uh, for anybody who's interested in that kind of a thing. Uh, all right, the, okay, I've got a list here of the things I said so I'm trying to go and try and keep track and I'll put buttons on this video so if you're interested you can click on the buttons. Okay, the f first I did one uh, really just thinking about the idea of the, of the, of the sacred this weird idea, and whether it, cause, which I just couldn't think of, uh, get a meaning for out of. So uh, it's a, I made a video of speculating on this idea of the sacred is a combination of valuing something with a very particular feeling accompanying that valuation. So it's a partly a cognitive process, or ra rational cognitive process, and partly an emotional cognitive process. Value plus. Um, this feeling and it's the, the feeling I'm talking about here is the feeling of the sublime the sublime okay the second video I did I'm, I might be getting the order wrong here but never mind is uh, trying to get, uh, get underneath this idea of the sublime so I did one uh, looking at its kind of historical understandings you know where it features in in writing and in art so I'll talk a little bit about the nature poets, particularly Wordsworth, and about uh, some painting traditions which favour the idea of the sublime as uh, that experience we have when we're confronted by something very large and very powerful, like a great force of nature or something like that, um, and how that might be carried over into metaphysical ideas. But it, it originates, so I claim, in, uh, yeah, in those kind of forces of nature. Okay, uh, then I talk about, yeah, then I give some kind of speculation, really, about possibly ev evolutionary psychology origins of that. Why would the why would the forces of nature, like you know, cr the crashing waves of a, a, a storm at sea or a, a huge expanse of nothingness, like when you stand on the edge of a cliff or just gazing up in the star at night, you know, why would those big, powerful things make us feel the way they do? And what I just kind of speculate there is that perhaps there's an evolutionary origin account. Um, you know, in the same way that a, a kind of rabbit freezes when it's caught in the headlights of a car, maybe we're caught in the headlights, uh, it's metaphorically speaking, maybe we're kind of uh, caught in, in these really huge headlights of nature which frightens us and startles us and makes us uh, fill, filled with this kind of feeling of kind of beautiful terror. So that's something to do with yeah, evolutionary origins. And then again, to flesh out some of the ideas, I do a little bit of work on the etymology of the word sublime, you know, where the word comes from. Um, and what I talk about there is how it's related uh, historically to the idea of standing on a threshold. Uh, sub means underneath and, and the, the line bit is from lintel, like you have at the top of a door. So when you're in a state of the, the sublime, at least linguistically speaking, you, you're standing in a doorway. So what I talk about there is, again, why would that be an image that's useful for that feeling associated with uh, the sublime. Sorry about the noise. Uh, so there I talk about it as being, you know, the doorway out of a safe, protected space, like a home, out into a wider world, which contains everything you want, but also everything you fear. And so it's that really weird, tentative sensation of being perhaps slightly paralysed associated with the sublime, just, just drawn and fleshed out from the etymology of the word. Uh, okay, so there should be a button on the screen now for that. Then I go a little bit about into how uh, other uses of the word sublime, and particularly in sublimation. So I talk about the word sublimation in, in chemistry, how it refers to the, uh, the behaviour of, of, of certain chemicals that go from a solid state to a gaseous state without passing through an intervening liquid phase. And I also talk about the word sublimation in uh, Freudian psychoanalysis and how so it's really noisy, isn't it? And how in, in Freudian psychoanalysis, the word sublimation refers to um, psychological processes, metaphorical psychological processes. But again, have this sense of something being contained, like contained in a room or contained in a solid or contained in, a, in, a, in an orderly sense of, of feeling of normal in the world and how that can feel ex rising and expanding. So this, this sense of being limitless and... and uh, kind of frightened by that. So I talk a little bit about that. Again, just to flesh out the, the word sublimation and see what the inferences and the entailments are for that idea. Then I try to relate that to some work in Kant, because Kant, philosopher, wrote about the sublime. Other people did too, Burke notably, but um, 
but can't write about it. So I'll talk a little bit about the what he calls the mathematical sublime and the dynamical sublime, which is this sense of the sense of, of the measurelessness and of the immeasurable power that the sublime holds for us. Again, just trying to flesh out some of the earlier ideas about why sublime feelings feel like that and how might we talk about those. Uh, so, button on the screen now. And then I go and talk about it, just the idea that, uh, really reflecting back on some of the stuff I did earlier about the nature poets and how some forms of writing and some uses of language can induce in us the same feelings of you know, being at the edge of nothingness, being confronted by something very large and very powerful. Just the, use, the, the judicious use of language can produce those feelings in us, non-consciously. So, so we're, we're starting to get this feeling of, of being slightly gobsmacked and awestruck just by careful use of the language. And I provide a little bit of uh, scientific support for that, drawn from um, cognitive neuroscience. And then finally, I talk about, uh, well, yes, again, again, the use of language, of, of, of language and speech and, and conversation, and how when we, in the presence of a person using certain kinds of language, they might induce certain feelings in us. And so I compare this, this feeling of the sublime that I'm talking about with other kinds of feelings that people's language might induce. You know, if someone is very trained in certain techniques, and I, I cite neuro-linguistic programming as an example, they might, and it's contested, but they might be able to induce us to feel, um, to feel warm towards them or to feel affectionate towards them. Not because they're, they're doing anything particular, but just because they have great control over their language. So on an unconscious level, they can induce certain feelings in us. That's the theory, at least. And so I speculate there whether there's something paralleling that going on in certain linguistic forms, certain language uses that people have and that poets have and other kinds of writing might have, which again induces us not to feel warm and affectionate towards an individual, but perhaps um, gobsmacked and awestruck about the universe. So the overall thing I'm trying to, I guess, I guess I'm saying here, and, and, and uh, coming out of this idea of the sacred maybe, is that this idea of, of, of sacredness is a combination of value mixed with a certain feeling which accompanies that, and this feeling is the sublime, the sublime, and, and that's a feeling which is being in the presence of something large and powerful, um, it has a whole set of physiological and, and psychological senses that go with it, which make us treat this particular value in a certain way, give it particular credence and credibility in a particular place in our culture. So valuable objects that are regarded as sacred are, are given more credit than just valuable objects which are um, not regarded as sacred. And one of the ways in which that sacredness, that feeling of, sublime, of sublimeness that accompanies value might be induced is through judicious use of language, particularly the language which induces the feeling of openness, of spaciousness, of powerfulness, of the infinity, of eternity, of boundlessness, and of um, yeah, of, that, of the kind of extinctions and the kinds of fears and the kinds of beauties that come out of that. Okay, thanks very much.